What I want to do now is introduce you to the main idea behind statistical inference. Remember what statistical inference was? In the video regarding the difference between a population and a sample, um, I've told you that the population is the entire body of possible observations, while a sample is a smaller random sample composed of observations from the population. Um, in the social sciences, they often work with samples. There are tons of examples. Election polls, for example. What would be our population? Well, every adult with the permission to vote. Can they ask every adult with the permission to vote in order to forecast elections? Of course they can't. So what they do is they construct a random sample of voters. Now what might be the problem when you're drawing inferences from a random sample that ought to be valid for the entire population? Well, you always have some sort of uncertainty. Estimates are always called point estimates. Now what is the main characteristic of an estimate? The word says it all. Estimation. It's not a 100% proof prediction of the future. Unless you are a determinist, this is not possible to do. So what we do is produce estimates of population parameters. It could be anything, the mean, a difference, or a coefficient. Um, you might be tempted to say, I'm a historian, why should I bother with samples? Especially if you're a macroeconomic historian, it might not be that obvious why this concept is important for what we will encounter. If you have data for every observation or you have population data, um, why not using it? Why bother with samples? Well, even if we are using population data, there still, is a, or there still are a lot of estimates when we'll dive into more advanced techniques and we'll talk about that later. So no matter if you're using population data or not, statistical inferences is of utmost importance to you. But because we are not dealing with predictions of any sorts, we won't cover probability or probabilities as a statistics course in financial economics would do. So first of all, let's talk about distributions. You remember our good old normal distribution, right? So it looked something like this. You have your scale and it looked something like this. So uh, now that looks bad. Just let me draw that again. Okay, that, that looks a bit better. <laughs> okay. Um, in reality, you'll never encounter a perfect normal distribution. So in this way, we always have to use a tolerance when we are talking about normal distribution. We had our mean and our standard deviation. Um, and because these two are able to describe a normal distribution pretty exactly, we call these the distribution's parameters. Now, what would happen if we change our mean? Well, we'd simply shift the distribution on the x-axis. So if this mean would be 50, what would happen? If we would say, okay, let's let's say the mean is 40, not 50. The same the same data, but the, the the mean is 40. Well, let's say 50 is over here, and 40 is over here. It would still look the same, but only with a different mean. Yeah, it would still look the same. Um, okay, now what would happen if we change our uh, standard deviation? You already know that it would get fatter in the tails and flatten out the peak if you'd increase your standard deviation and cluster around the peak and flatten out the tails if you'd lower your standard deviation. So it might look something like this. If you increase the standard deviation, it might look something like this. And again, this looks better. The mean is 50. Okay, so it might look something like this. Um, and if you uh, decrease your standard deviation, it might look something like this. Yeah? So that's the difference. Now, a neat little thing you can do are z-scores. The z-score uh, only tells you how many standard deviations one observation is away from the mean. So you already know how to do this. Remember when I wanted to find out how many standard deviations the Parisian wheat price was away from the mean of, what, of wheat prices in France? Well, basically, that was a z-score. If your z-score is positive, it is above the mean, and if your z-score is negative, it is below the mean. If you have calculated a z-score, and again, we won't do that, the computer will do that for us, um, and you are in a normal distribution, you can also tell the associated percentile it is in. So uh, if you know the percentiles uh, for every associated z-score, you can give um, according probabilities. So remember, um, we talked about quartiles, so the third quartile was 75% of our observations are below our, um, our value, um, our, our observation, and a percentile is like the, the 68th percentile. percentile. Um, and um, it, just, it just says that 68% of our observations are below this value, for example.
So let me draw a normal distribution again. So with the mean 50, for example. Okay, that looks kind of okay. So the mean is 50. Um, okay, now let's say your value, value is exactly in the 95% percentile. That would mean if 95% of our data, of our observations are below um, our, our value. So let's say it is right here. So this would mean that 95 our, of our data is below the value, let's say this is 60, okay? This would say that 95% of our data is below 60. So the shaded area right here, or the, the, the area right here under the bell, these, or this is 95% of our observations. Or in other words, there's a 95% chance that if you would uh, pick one random observation, your data will, data will be uh, out from this area, okay? Um, now, there's a very important rule of thumb regarding the probability. We say that the chances under normal distribution of falling within um, three standard deviation of uh, three standard deviations, um, so within minus three or positive three standard deviation is equal to 99.7%. So let me draw that. So again, we have our normal distribution with mean 50. So let me just draw that. Oh, no, that looks that looks bad. So it looks like this, for example, and we say, okay, if we have a normal distribution that kind of is like a normal distribution, we say that there's a 99.7% um, chance that your that one observation falls within three standards, standard deviations away from the mean. So it would be, let's say, this area right here, okay? This area right here, the, the, the red area, these are 99.7%. 7% of our observations, okay? So this area right here. Okay, um, now the rule of thumb also says that um, if you're two standard deviations away from the, 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 the mean, the corresponding probability is uh, 95%. So if you're two standard uh, deviations away, that would be, let's say, this area right here. So the blue area two standard deviations within the mean, that would be, oh, sorry, I'm too far away. So that would be 95%. Uh, the same goes for one standard deviation. I'm running out of space, so I'll just tell you that. Um, the same goes for one standard deviation, and if you're one or the, the corresponding probability of being within one standard deviation from the mean would be 68%. So I know this sounds a bit technical and weird, but this is an extremely important concept uh, when it comes to hypothesis testing. So check out the next video when we are talking about hypothesis testing.